Good evening. This is the Rules and Legislative Oversight Committee. Um, we're here to hear multiple executive appointments. I am Councilman Isaac Itzi Schleifer, Chair of the Committee. Uh, to my left is uh, Councilman Conway, uh, Councilwoman Ramos, Council Vice President Middleton, uh, and Councilman uh, Costello. Um, and I will go uh, in order that I have you here, uh, with one exception, we're going to uh, save EA 23-0198 Corinne Johnson for the end, for obvious reasons. Uh, that's going to be a little longer than the rest of them. When your name is called, if you can just introduce yourself and tell us why you are interested in serving on the committee or commission that you are being appointed to. Um, we'll start with EA 23-0195, uh, Lady uh, Byron, member of the Public's, uh, Public Arts Commission. Try that again. Hello. Uh, my name is Lady Breon. I am uh, a poet in the city. I'm also the executive director of the Pennsylvania Avenue Black Arts and Entertainment District um, over in West Baltimore. And, um, you know, we've existed for three years, and the work of all arts and entertainment districts is to really think about how to make our uh, locales in the city. Um, destinations for people to come and enjoy arts and entertainment, as well as support um, public art in our different locales across the city in the state of Maryland, um, as well as thinking about working to the benefit of creatives in the city of Baltimore. And so um, my intention, um, being a part of the commission, is to be the voice for the arts and entertainment districts as a part of the commission and thinking about uh, ways to make sure that the percentage for public art is to the benefit of creatives in the city, um, is accessible um, for uh, creatives who would like to do artistic product, production um, using the funding from the percentage for uh, public works and um, really just make sure that we are represented and thinking about, particularly as we think about cultural equity in the city, that it is more accessible um, to Baltimore's largest population, which is black folks. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, you got any uh, poetry you want to share with us? Any favorite? <laughs> Uh, I didn't come prepared with a special poem for you all. Next time, uh, okay. I promise, I will be ready. Uh, no problem. We'll, we'll let it slide. <laughs> uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, okay. thank you. Um, I've had an opportunity to work with Lady Brian over the past couple of years uh, with the Black Arts and Entertainment District. A lot of their focus is on Pennsylvania Avenue, which is in the 11th, uh, in the 7th District, uh, which I share with uh, Councilman Torrance. So fully supportive of this nomination. She's been a great community partner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, that's one strike against you. I'm sorry. Um, any other questions? Uh, go ahead, Council Vice President. I would be remiss if I didn't say a few words. Um, I remember this young lady when she was uh, just starting out as a poet with the Poet Laureate group and um, she has um, just been a very strong supporter of me. She um, is, you, you call her and she will make a way to support and help you. She has uh, worked and did some things with the Baltimore City Chapter um, links, which I am a member of and on several occasions. Um, she, just to watch her flourish the way that she has, um, I am just so happy for her. And you keep doing the wonderful things that you're doing, especially there in that um, Pennsylvania Avenue corridor. And um, definitely have my full support. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so after your, your turn, you have two options. You can stick around. Uh, we're going to do a collective vote at the end, um, or you could leave. You have no obligation to stay, um, so it's, it's up to you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next, the next up is EA 23-0197, uh, Robin Russell Allen, member of the Planning Commission. Yes, thank you. I appreciate um, being here and having the opportunity to speak, and I also appreciate being nominated or um, presented as a candidate. I have been serving on the Planning Commission since, I believe, October 2017, 
and I um, have been brought again as a candidate to serve again on the Planning Commission. I worked on the Planning Department from 1988 until 2012, so I appreciate the opportunity to serve again. Uh, I'm with um, Councilman Costello, and uh, well, I'm kind of tongue-tied right now, but I would like to um, continue serving on the Planning Commission. I'm a lifelong resident of Baltimore City. I attended Baltimore City Public Schools. I served as the director of um, planning for uh, facilities uh, for the city school system from 2012 until, I'm sorry, 2007 until 2012. And then um, I've been retired for a number of years. So I'm open to any questions that anyone might have. Oh, well, thank you for your service. Uh, any questions? Councilman Costello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say, I've, as the City Council's representative to the Planning Commission, I've had the opportunity um, to, uh, to serve with Robin for, uh, I think, about two and a half years now. She has been nothing but a pleasure to work with, um, brings incredible insight and perspective to the Planning Commission. She's a valued member of that group, and I'm fully support supportive of this nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Chair. Councilman. Councilman Ramos. Yeah, thank you. Um, also uh, extremely supportive of uh, Ms. Allen. She's been obviously my constituent, but also um, very thoughtful on the Planning Commission, which um, I is greatly appreciated. I think everybody uh, on the commission is, and I uh, would love to, to see her there still. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. Um, the next up is EA 23-0196, Barbara Kornman. She sent in uh, a letter, so all members of the committee have that in their inbox. Mr. Chair. Uh, go ahead. May I say a couple words on her behalf? Sure. Sure. Um, uh, Ms. Corman has uh, been a champion for um, uh, older adults, um, and I know that she's on the um, Commission for Aging as well and would be a great um, asset to the, um, to the board. Thanks. She's also my constituent, so of course I think she's amazing. All right, thank you. Hopefully she approves that message. Um, next up is EA 23-0199, uh, Claudia freeland Jollin, member of the Planning Commission. Great, thank you. Good, evening. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry if I butchered the name. It's okay. It's mm -hmm. Claudia Jollin, but we'll get okay. there. Um, I'm a proud resident and homeowner in Baltimore. I've been working in economic development for about 10 years here in the city. Um, had the pleasure of working at Baltimore Development Corporation, also here in the mayor's office as well, and I'm now at Downtown Partnership of Baltimore. Um, in, ba in previous to being here, I was working in international policy in D.C., and also as a data analyst for the United States Navy as an active duty member. In my role at the partnership, I have gained a very deep understanding of real estate and development in Baltimore City, and also, not only that, had the pleasure of really meeting others similar in different cities and nationally and internationally. Um, as a commissioner, if I am you know, chosen, which is gonna be awesome, um, I really do believe in the original intent of the commission itself, which is to take a look at what the plan says and really adhere to that. But since we are people and not documents, there's also a need to have diversity thinking about the way the city is going to be, not only today, but in the future, and really taking that attitude toward any of the plans that come in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Councilman Costello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Apparently the administration is appointing all people today that I've had the opportunity to work with. Uh, Ms. Jolin is the uh, Vice President uh, for Economic Development at Downtown Partnership. I've had the pleasure of working with her uh, over, I, I don't know, God knows how many years at this point, um, but Claudia has been uh, fantastic to work with. I think has a deep understanding of economic development and think would, uh, I believe she would be a great asset to the Planning Commission. I fully support the nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Looks like Conway. it's a District 14 party today, actually. Councilman Conway. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I too happen to uh, know Ms. Claudia very well. Um, I can't even say how long we've known each other. We had the opportunity to work with each other uh, while I worked in the mayor's office. So um, I can speak very highly for her uh, ability to think through problems uh, very thoughtfully and think she'd be a great addition to the commission. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, thank you. Next up, EA 23-0200, Max Grossfeld, member of the Baltimore City Wage Commission. Thank you, Councilman. Um, anyone who knows me knows that uh, my favorite saying is this is a pro-labor household. I am passionate about ensuring that the workers of Baltimore City get what they deserve. Um, I have started the Labor and Employment Law Association at the University of Maryland Carey Law. Uh, in order to further the next generation of labor lawyers. And I am very much looking forward to working with the mayor's office in order to ensure that um, people get what's coming to them. And uh, I do want to thank my colleague at the University of Maryland, Jill Muth, for uh, recommending me for this position. I know you guys have worked with her, and she's fantastic. Um, and I am just, I'm here, and ready to get to work. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions? Ooh. Councilman Torrance. I will say I've heard great things about you and I forgive you for going to the other law school. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Councilman. All right, thank you very much. Next up, EA 23-0201, Chloe Strach Stracher, member Baltimore City Wage Commission. Hi, thank you for having me here. Uh, this is Chloe Starcher. Um, I'm a membership development representative for IBW Local 24. I've been involved with, with labor in general since I got into our, the apprenticeship program at the Baltimore Electrical JTC in 2014. Went through the apprenticeship, topped out as a journeyman, and prior to my current role, I, I worked in the field, obviously as an apprentice and then as a journeyman um, for uh, a little over eight years, and I, it's abundantly clear how much of a difference being paid correctly makes in a person's life. It affects them on all levels, not only financially, which is obvious, but their emotional well-being and all aspects of their lives. So I'm, I'm honored to have been nominated for this position, and I um, am really, I'm, I'm looking forward to be on, put, being able to put in the work to ensure that all workers in Baltimore City are paid correctly. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions? Mr. Chair. Um, I've had the opportunity to um, talk with uh, Ms. Starcher, and I'm really excited to have you in this position. So thank you so much for stepping up. Really appreciate it. It's, it's going to be great, especially given the issues that, we're, that we talked about before, um, because we still have many of our um, newly arrived residents that are not getting a fair shake, um, and this is gonna be extremely important, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, EA 23-0202, R. Anthony Mills, Office of Water Consumer Advocacy Appeals Okay, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> All right, that was my test. Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, so again, my name is Mills. It's Ronald Anthony Mills. Uh, I'm a longtime resident of Park Heights, over 20 years. Um, very active in my neighborhood, the Green Spring neighborhood of the Park Heights community. Uh, I did also mention that I've also lived in Fairfield, Westport, Cherry Hill, uh, areas of Park Heights. So. 
I have a unique perspective on working with communities of need and look forward to continuing working on behalf of residents of Baltimore City and happy to answer any questions that there might be. Thank you. Council Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, any words about um, Mr. Mills. Is um, He's being very nice, but he is very involved in his neighborhood. I've uh, been a council member for going into my 17th year now, and um, he has been active with the boards within Park Heights, Park Heights Renaissance, um, several other boards, uh, PCDA board. He uh, loves his community and um, is definitely a uh, advocate for um, helping communities in need and uh, just has been very supportive of uh, the work that I do in the area. And um, Glad to have you on board in, a, in, a, in another capacity, and um, I'm here to help in any way I can as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, you know, really good to see Mr. Mills, or as I would often say, Brother Mills. Um, uh, known this man for a very, very long time and know his uh, hardworking nature, his heart is in the right place, and I think uh, he great, he'd be a great addition in this role, and I'm really, really looking forward to working with him and supporting him uh, along the way. So just want to express my support for you in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much. Next up, EA 23-0203, Faviola. Donato Galando, Baltimore Hispanic Commission. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me, and thank you for your consideration for the Hispanic Commission. I've been a resident of Baltimore for many years, um, and um, in my previous roles, um, I've supported um, the Latino community with Baltimore City Public Schools and making sure that they had access to programs and services, just like as any other student. Um, I'm part of the Latino Providers Network, which is an organization here in Baltimore City that supports organizations serving the Latino community. I'm also a board member of Adelante Latina, which is the unique program serving uh, Hispanic young Latinas in Baltimore City, making sure that they get access to college. Um, so thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Any questions? No. Nope. Okay, thank you so much. Um, also, EA 23-0206, uh, Michelle, um, Michelle Goins also uh, sent the letter, um, and so all council members should have that. Uh, the next up is EA 23-0205, Elizabeth Halfley, member of the Baltimore Municipal and Zoning Appeals. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Hafey. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to be here today uh, to to, um, for this uh, nomination to BMZA. I am an attorney by training. I have um, worked in private practice and also worked at in state affairs with uh, Johns Hopkins most recently. I have uh, experience working on boards. Um, I was on the liquor board. I served on the liquor board under two different chairs uh, in the last I guess six years or so, and uh, so I bring with that I bring with me that experience of working on the board and the experience of working as an attorney and working uh, for state affairs. I am really excited to get started. I think uh, public service is really important, and that's why I'm really excited to be to be nominated for this position. Okay, thank you, Councilman Costello. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've known Ms. Hafey for a number of years uh, in her capacity as a commissioner with the Liquor Board. Um, I have found her to be incredibly thoughtful, uh, intelligent, hardworking, um, and I think she would make an excellent addition uh, to the BMZA. I'm fully supportive of this nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. Um, I 
also have had the pleasure of uh, knowing Ms. Tafey for a very long time, serving both on the liquor board and, and well before that, and have always been impressed by um, the level of thought and, and care that she puts into her, all the service that she provides for the, for the city, and look forward to you know supporting you and continuing that service in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, yes. that, you have a question? Yes. Oh, go ahead. I just want to, I was, you know how you um, remember a face, but you don't remember where you've seen the person from, and after you introduced yourself, I remember the, um, when we were doing, when the city was going through Transform Baltimore and uh, just reforming, um, the liquor board and establishments throughout areas, and I remember your advocacy um, in the Park Heights area, um, particularly as we were working to, um, you know, it's a peripheration of liquor stores there, and we were at the time making changes to the hours and so on just to get a hold of that, and remember you uh, working and um, being part of meetings within that area. So um, my chance to say thank you for that and looking forward to your continued work and advocacy with the city. Thank you. Thank you. And so without objection, I'd like to move uh, to approve all of the nominations that we've heard. Um, do I have a second? Second. Seconded by uh, Councilman Conway. We'll do a roll call. Chair Schleifer. Yes. Chair Schleifer votes aye. Mr. Burnett is to be absent. Mr. Costello. Aye. Mr. Costello votes aye. Vice President Middleton. Aye. Vice President Middleton votes aye. Member Ramos. Yes. Member Ramos votes aye. Mr. Torrance. Aye. Mr. Torrance votes aye. Mr. Conway. Aye. Mr. Conway votes aye. Mr. Chair, there's six votes in the affirmative known negatives these nominations can go to second read at the july meeting okay thank you and thank you all of you for your willingness to serve um that concludes that portion of the hearing and so you're welcome to leave and we'll proceed with the next part of the hearing
All right, uh, we are going into EA 23-0198, Corin Johnson, Director of the Baltimore City Department of Transportation. Uh, Director, uh, thank you very much for all of your service to date. Um, excited about your nomination, and um, without further ado, take it away. All right, turn thank over you. Turn questions, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Schleifer and honorable members of the committee. Um, as said, I'm Corin Johnson, Interim Director for the Baltimore City Department of Transportation. First, let me say, the smoke kind of got me, so my voice is like a little scratchy right now, so excuse me if I have to stop or anything. Um, I would like to say thank you to the Honorable Mayor Scott for his support and this opportunity to lead DOT. Although this is not our first introduction, I would like to take a moment to provide you insights regarding my qualifications for this position. I'm a proud graduate of North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, where I received a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil and Environmental Engineering. I also graduated from the then University of Maryland University College with a Master's of Science in Project Management. As a believer in continuous learning and development, I've completed extensive training to include the National Leadership Institute training program at University of Maryland and Astro Leadership Training. My service to Baltimore began in September 2021 when I joined TOT as the Chief Engineer and Deputy Director for Complete Streets. A notable project that I championed for during this time was the Central Avenue Project. I stand on my belief to uphold safety, accessibility, and transportation access for all, which is why, despite the opposing pressure, I stood firm in what I believed to be in the best interest of the residents of our city and was able to deliver a completed project with protected bike lanes and safer, shorter crossings for pedestrians. Prior to joining the city, I held various positions with the Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration with over 17 years. Most recently, I was the first black female district engineer from Maryland, overseeing District 5, which includes Anne Arundel, Calvert, Charles, and St. Mary's counties. In this capacity, I managed project development, construction, 24-7 maintenance operations, traffic and vision zero efforts, developer projects, utilities, procurement, finance, human resources, and community elected official and government relations. To address major pedestrian safety concerns on Maryland 450 in front of the Annapolis Library, now the Michael E. Bush Annapolis Library, I led the implementation of the second high intensity activated crosswalk or Hawk Beacon in Maryland and the first in Anne Arundel County and improved travel times and operations with the award winning US 50 Seven River Bridge widening project. I was also the Chief of the Traffic Operations Division, responsible for the construction, maintenance, and operations of traffic signals and large sign structures, sign manufacturing, testing of new equipment, and reviews of automated speed enforcement plans. These duties supported MDOT SHA's infrastructure statewide. Some noteworthy accomplishments during this tenure include implementing adaptive signal technology, instituting send tracks to provide remote connectivity and operational management of multiple traffic signals within a network, and developing all new SIPs to improve contract management oversight. While serving as the Chief of the Construction Support Division, I provided strategic leadership over construction data management, directed the procurement of supplemental and construction management and inspection contracts statewide, developed and delivered training for construction and safety personnel, and made enhancements to directives, policies, and procedures for operational and administrative process improvements. Earlier in my career, I was the Engineering Access Permits Division Inge Area Engineer for State Roadways within Montgomery County, a Designer and Project Manager in Highway Design Division of Office of Highway Development, an Area Engineer overseeing multiple projects in construction, and a Traffic Engineer. My diverse experience has equipped me with a unique perspective, allowing me to consider transportation challenges holistically. I have successfully led large-scale infrastructure projects, ensuring their time and completion on time and on budget. I have collaborated with multidisciplinary teams to implement technologies and strategies that enhance safety and efficiency in systems. I have worked closely with policymakers and stakeholders to ensure that transportation policies align with the needs and aspirations of our communities. I have put boots on the ground numerous times, seeking creative, collaborative solutions to challenges. And finally, I have demonstrated my passion for training, coaching, and mentoring by developing programs, facilitating training, and devoting my time to those teams I've led in the past, as well as with youth organizations. Under my leadership, the Baltimore City Department of Transportation, in partnership with BSET, has successfully initiated an asset management inventory effort with Cyclomedia. This application provides access to high-resolution three-dimensional imagery that is merged with LiDAR-generated digital elevation model, providing the ability to view and take measurements with a high degree of accuracy of assets citywide. 
We've instituted the new curbside commercial policy, providing businesses the opportunity to expand operations within abutting parking lanes while prioritizing pedestrian safety and promoting community level economic development. We have received millions of dollars in grant funding from programs like Safe Streets for All, Reconnecting Communities, and Maryland's Highway Safety Improvement Program, and currently have other grant applications in development. And we've been working to deliver a better customer experience by becoming more responsive, explaining the why, and being intentional in our communications. The qualities that I cherish are integrity, accountability, and empathy. These motivate me to do what is right, to focus on communication and collaboration, understand the importance of coaching staff for positive results, setting expectations for myself and my team, and take time to understand the needs and thoughts of others. If entrusted with the honor of being Director of Transportation, first and foremost, I will focus on safety and accessibility. This is of the utmost importance to me personally, and I've heard your voices and those of your citizens who are concerned about the safety of the roads where they and their children live and play. I recognize that there have been inequities and injustices in the past, and I am committed to advancing equitable transportation so that public investments in transportation benefit all, not some. As I have already begun focusing on relationship building with each of you, I will continue to strengthen relationships and foster partnerships with stakeholders, industry leaders, and organizations to harness the transformative power of our collective insights, expertise, and resources. I know that transportation choices significantly impact our environment, and it is our duty to minimize our carbon footprint while fostering a more sustainable future. I will support the expansion of public transit networks and accessible pedestrian facilities and encourage active modes of transportation to create a greener and healthier city. And last but not least, as a leader of people, I will ensure that, the, that their needs are met. DOT is a team of great individuals, true servants, who have a collective goal to see a beautiful Baltimore whose transportation system enhances the quality of life for those that we serve. I can only be successful with the support, dedication, and expertise of my team. So in front of this committee, my staff who are here with me today, and those watching virtually, I wanna say thank you to each and every DOT employee who is committed to this city and who has so greatly supported me in this role. Supporting them means developing an organizational structure that supports excellence, filling gaps in our workforce, providing training and mentoring opportunities, and leveraging IT to create processes and systems that reduce redundancies and unnecessary manual operations to increase our efficiency. In conclusion, I humbly request your trust and support as I embark on this journey. I have been a city resident for nearly 20 years, and I'm eager to work collaboratively with each of you to achieve our shared vision of a transportation network that is safe, efficient, accessible, and environmentally conscious. Together, we can shape the course of our city's transportation infrastructure for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Costello. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Acting Director, hopefully for the last time, uh, or Interim Director Johnson, uh, it has been nothing short of a pleasure to work with you. You have been incredibly responsive, uh, reasonable, flexible, uh, very thoughtful uh, in how you've handled every single situation that I've worked with you on. Uh, I've talked to many of the people that are sitting before us today uh, to ask about you, and everyone has had nothing but glowing recommendations of your leadership within the department. Uh, the city of Baltimore is incredibly fortunate to have someone of your caliber and experience working with us. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm a hard yes on this nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Um, Council Vice President. Uh, I'd just like to add with um, what Councilman, uh, Councilman Costello had mentioned that uh, your office has been very responsive to uh, my needs in the 6th District. Um, your liaison, and I start from the, the beginning, your liaison has always been responsive, answers, has answered every email. Um, and then there's, you know, follow through. Some uh, constituents are not happy, but mm -hmm. some, you know, you, you, um, your office research and you follow policies and um, you just do the best you, you can do. I remember before you came on board, there, there were some problems with communication and just kind of getting uh, transportation back in, um, 
a very respectable order, and you have um, worked very hard um, making that happen. So um, thank you, and I also hope that you will now, after this meeting, will not be acting anymore. Thank you, Council Vice President. Yeah. Anybody else? Councilwoman Ramos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you also, Director, for all that you've, you've done. Uh, somehow you've loosened up some of the blockage from getting stuff done in our districts. Uh, you know, and part of it, I think, is listening to people who are working in your office and are working uh, with us all the time and them saying, wait, can't we do it this way? And you saying, yeah, let's do it. So I think empowering your staff is extremely important um, as well. So I very much appreciate, um, I very much appreciate that. I'm thrilled at the progress we're seeing um, in my district, really. It's astounding. So I'm really grateful. So thank you so much. Appreciate really it. Thank appreciate you, Councilwoman. It. Thank you. Councilman Torrance. I said this before and I'll say it again. I am an emphatic yes and look forward to our partnership, especially with saving the city money. Let me say that yes. again, saving the city money. Um, thank you through innovation with you and I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, I really, really looking forward to working with you. It has been a breath of fresh air since you've come in and you've been a partner through and through. I think all of us can share in that in that endeavor and I'm looking forward to continuing to support you in the job. I know um, the, the department has had a lot of challenges lately across the board and the, I think you're, you're the person to, to take on those challenges and I look forward to finding ways to address those issues, mm -hmm. whether it's within the department or through other partnerships. Um, we had a long conversation in advance of this hearing um, in which we talked about some of those things and mm -hmm. I, 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 I do appreciate you and, and want to continue to work with you and, and figure out how we can continue to make our, our streets safe and, um, and, and make sure that um, traffic is, is um, flowing in a productive way. So thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. All right, thank you. Um, do we have a motion? Mr. Chair, I move the uh, nomination favorably. Second. 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 Uh, moved by Costello, uh, seconded by Conway. Chair Schleifer. Yes. Chair Schleifer votes aye. Mr. Burnett is absent. Mr. Costello. Aye. Mr. Costello votes aye. Vice President Middleton. Aye. Vice President Middleton votes aye. Member Ramos. Yes. Member Ramos votes aye. Mr. Torrance. Aye. Mr. Torrance votes aye. Mr. Conway. Aye. Mr. Conway votes aye. Mr. Chair, there's six votes in the affirmative, no negative. We can go to second reader in the July meeting. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Director. Thank you very much, Chairman and members of the committee. Appreciate you. Thank you.
Next, next up, 23-0402, uh, Board of Municipal Zoning Appeals uh, Consent Agenda Establishment. Um, I will ask anybody who's here, um, and we'll be speaking on that, to come forward. And anybody who wishes to testify on this bill, if you can please sign in. And we'll give you an opportunity to testify at the end. All right, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Um, we are here to address a new issue that's forcing seniors, people uh, with disabilities and large families out of the city. And although this change occurred overnight without conversation with the public and the council, the solution won't occur as quickly. Uh, after discussions with BMZA leadership, it was suggested to make a variety of legislative changes. Many of those changes would have many unintended consequences and would remove the discretion that the board has had for decades. So this is just the first conversation uh, that we will have on this topic, and I look forward to future conversations. Um, this is just a preliminary one, and we'll get into uh, agency reports uh, at a future hearing uh, and for further discussion. Uh, but I've been working closely with the administration to find the most appropriate uh, solutions uh, to this issue. And uh, so I will now ask uh, the mayor's office, uh, Deputy Mayor Williams, uh, to speak on some of those changes uh, and anything else you'd like to say on the bill. Is on? Good uh, afternoon, members of the council, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, Justin Williams, Deputy Mayor for Community and Economic Development. Just wanted to, well, I have legislation that was we drafted kind of in conjunction with you. I don't know if you have copies for the committee to review. So the, um, the administration's position is outlined in the recitals of the one of the pieces of legislation that's before you, that the city's economic prosperity depends on creating more jobs and more housing and spurring increased investment in the city. And to promote the speed and predictability of zoning approvals is one way to get there and help you know, promote investment in our city. So jointly, there's two pieces of legislation that might address some of the issues that have arisen. Um, lately with the BMZA. <clears throat> I'll go through the small one first, the one pager piece of legislation. One issue that's arisen is for non-conforming structures. This is a pro these would be properties located in districts where they might have been constructed prior to the advent of the zoning code. And it happened in one in your district, Mr. Chair, where they tried to do a building extension, but it was non-conforming because it was too close to the side yard, <clears throat> if I recall correctly. And so as drafted, the interpretation from the current BMZA members was that they were not allowed to grant variances for that. And so this legislation here would just conform to prior practice, which is in place under the old zoning code and more recently until a few months ago, where they could grant a variance if the standards are met. So that's the non-conforming structure legislation. <clears throat> more broadly, and this is for a good policy discussion for this, this committee to have, more broadly is about how we look as a city to approve variances and how we review our processes. Because um, there's kind of the issue of legislating Stuff we kind of know common sense why it should be approved. We don't want to see development happen, it's common sense stuff, but you can't just put in writing, it's a common sense thing, we should approve it. <clears throat> so the big proposal that would be kind of the, there's two, two changes here, I guess, that are in this bigger piece of legislation. One would be 
establishing the minor variance process for all owner-occupied homes. The thinking there being that if you're an owner-occupant for property, you shouldn't have to go to the zoning board for a public hearing if it's non-controversial and it's a, it's a kind of a request that by definition doesn't raise community concerns because they're not complaining about it. So the process would be similar to what's in place in Baltimore County where you would submit an application to the zoning administrator or his designee for review of the standards and if it meets the standards and they post the property and no one submits a complaint or a concern within a certain time frame as drafted, I believe it's 20 days. I'll double check that, but the, the property is posted and after 20 days there's no complaint or no request from a neighbor for a hearing, then the zoning administrator doesn't need can then review the case and if it meets the standards, approve it right there without the need for a hearing. The thinking there being that it helps promote efficiency of the docket for approval processes and also makes it easier for the BMZA committee or the board members to actually review cases that are important and give it the time it deserves and so people who are there to support a case or oppose a major case can know that the case will be heard in a reasonable time and not to sit there all afternoon or all evening in some circumstances. <clears throat> the other major proposal in this legislation would be to change the standards for granting a variance. So one, so right now as drafted, it's in 5-308, <clears throat> the approval standards right now set out a requirement that the conditions on which the application is based are unique to the property for which the variance is sought. sought. <clears throat> and so there's been, to my knowledge, an interpretation issue where in certain neighborhoods, where, they, for example, many row homes, one can make the assertion that each row home is basically the same, every property is the same, and therefore the issues that present for those properties are not unique to the property. There's a counter argument, and then I'm a former land use attorney, you could you read it the other way and say, well, it's about the entire zone and the R8 zone in Charles Village is different than the R8 zone in Federal Hill and different than the R8 zone in Canton. But to help, I think, move the window towards allowing more approvals for sort of the cases where it's a homeowner doing a minor change, like a roof deck, expansion of their rear property, the, there'd be a second standard by which you can grant a variance, and that'd be for this is where it's in B308A2. It'd be just because of exceptional circumstances. And so this would be something, I, mean, I think we have to flesh out as a council to, to discern what the kind of things that you would consider to be an ex extraordinary circumstance. In my mind, it'd be something like, you know, uh, that the, the property doesn't have rear access or outdoor backyard, so you need a roof deck because you want to have an enjo enjoyable, a way to enjoy the environment with your friends and family. Something like that where it could be argued under the current reading of the code, under the current version of the code that needing a roof deck is not a unique, a unique circumstance because every row home on the block was built and it's not a unique situation. So that's the kind of circumstance where having the second opportunity to have an ex exceptional circumstance would be an opportunity for the board to use more discretion when they see fit to grant the variance. Okay, thank you. And I want to also highlight a couple other things uh, in layman terms, uh, the benefits of this, of this bill. Uh, first off, this is for residential properties and for residents, for all of our constituents across the entire city. When it comes to large-scale developments, which is separate from this, developers can afford lawyers and all of the process that goes along with that. Unfortunately, uh, many of our constituents don't have that same ability uh, when seeking a variance. And so that is one highlight for me that's important uh, why we need to have a streamlined process. Uh, number two also is uh, streamlining just the amount of time that the process is uh, taking as uh, Deputy um, Mayor Williams has, has mentioned that having that process will um, will streamline that and give the board the opportunity to focus on bigger projects and also ones that have uh, more complexities. Uh, another uh, difference uh, that I think is very important is uh, the practical difference uh, difficulty piece when we have constituents such as ones with 
illnesses or disabilities. Uh, you know, I have a constituent who has ALS, uh, and even if the property is not unique, uh, that they would still have the ability to go ahead and uh, build a first floor entryway into their home um, so that they continue to, uh, to, to be able to stay in their home that they've lived in for, for many years. Um, and the other thing I also want to point out is that uh, this also, there's, there's more to the process already as it is and that will continue to be there. Uh, you have the planning department does weigh in on, on variances and so if there's something out of the ordinary, something that um, needs to be addressed. The planning department does step up and, and talk about that during the hearings. Uh, and it also gives, it really puts the power uh, into the residents of Baltimore to decide uh, what's happening and what's not happening in their neighborhoods. And so uh, every neighborhood is different and unique, which is uh, the greatest strength of Baltimore City. We're a city of, of a few hundred neighborhoods. Uh, and what's good in one neighborhood might not be good for the other neighborhood and vice versa. And so giving neighbors the opportunity to determine uh, what they would like to see in their community is very important, and, uh, and this bill will, will help with that. Uh, and, and the other thing that, um, that I want to mention uh, before we get into questions uh, is that we've received um, emails, many letters of support. We've added it to the bill file. Uh, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to testify who would like to, uh, but before we do that, I'd like to see if any of my colleagues have any questions um, on this bill. Anyway. Councilman Ramos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a general question. I think, um, uh, Ms. Witt, you're going to bring up an example that I'm about to bring up. Um, <clears throat> this happened in my district, 3003 Elm, um, and it turns out that um, that family, that whole area, those two blocks, are actually zoned incorrectly. Um, they're non-conforming. There are seven, and there's no, there's no room. There's just no room to move. And yet, several residents in those two blocks have had variances granted just through this consent process, right? So my constituent is like, okay, this is gonna be great. And it doesn't work because we're not doing the consent anymore. But it turns out that it may have been, it, it could be solved, it can be solved in this case, by rezoning it to where it should be, which is an R8, given the bulk regulations. So I'm kind of curious, um, and maybe this is for the sponsor and also for the deputy mayor, if um, we are setting an a, a process, whether it's the chairman's bill or this bill, that would still, um, we still have the same issue with the zoning code <laughs> if we do it this way. So I'm kind of curious how we would manage the two. Do you so, understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, so that was um, you know, something taken into consideration, also something that is an opportunity when uh, looking at variances that were denied that had been approved for neighbors on the exact same block. Um, I have an example, there's two houses right now under construction on one block of my district. Uh, a third neighbor came along and requested to do less than what the previous two, they happened to gotten in a month before this, uh, this overnight change and so the only option for them today that's afforded to them being that it was denied uh, would be a rezoning. And, and my concern about going ahead and spot rezoning, which we do have the ability to do as a council, uh, is that there's a lot of unintended consequences that go along with that. And so instead of just changing the, the regulations where it would change the setbacks that are in place across the board, which will work in some places and won't work in others, uh, the same thing goes to when you rezone a property you, you're rezoning it today based on what you feel is best for that project today, but then you're changing the future of what can happen at that property. And so once you allow additional uses, it no longer, uh, we no longer have those controls in place. And so anything else within that same zoning code that you change it to would, would be allowed to buy that property and, and change the use, something that you didn't expect to see coming. And so that's why I feel as a bill sponsor that it's important that we give the zoning board the ability to do what they were appointed to do and what they've done for decades, which is uh, to look at all the facts, 
and to make what they believe is the best judgment call for what's in the best interest of the city um, in that current situation. So I think that rezoning each one is, is a problem. And in addition to that, it gets to the, one of the first things that I had mentioned. The cost to rezone is, is quite costly. I don't, I don't know the, the raw cost, I'm sure. Um, somebody else here can, can speak to that. Uh, but it costs many thousands of dollars to, to rezone a property, legal fees and others. The constituents that I have that, that call my office looking for variances, they don't have the capacity to do that. When they're, when they're going and saying, hey, we'd like to enclose a side porch so that you know, our grandmother can move in with us because she can no longer live on her own, the build out is already costing them you know, more than they, than they can necessarily afford. And then when you go and throw in the cost of a rezoning, which doesn't necessarily even guarantee that it would happen, uh, that becomes very problematic in my opinion. Uh, so thank you for that question. No, I appreciate that and I appreciate um, the sentiment because I agree with you. In this particular case, it makes sense to actually rezone those two blocks, like a, a whole thing and the initiative would come from my office, it wouldn't come from the, um, the applicant. So um, we would, I guess we would just have to figure, figure that out. I'm not opposed to what you're trying to do here. I just think that there's, there's, there's going to be times where there's actually an error in the zoning code. <laughs> in right. this case, I think that is the case. In my case, I think that is the case. And so we would want to take the whole section, not just that particular sure. property. Do you know yeah, what I mean? And I'm not opposed to what you want to do there. So, um, you know, I understand when there's, we, we've seen that come across certain you know, properties that are on different lines of zoning codes. And so certainly that, I think, is a separate issue for, uh, for a different time. Um, Mr. Chair, I do have another Chair, question. If I, I can just, address Mr. Chair, oh. Go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. If I may, I mean, I think one advantage to the proposed legislation with the minor variance procedure being available to any owner-occupied home would be to have sort of a shortcut for this instance where we all know it's incorrectly zoned, but it might take even at the earliest, it would take month, four months, five, six least. months to rezone yeah. in time and effort from your staff or our staff to post a property, do all the steps that are necessary. In theory, with the minor variance process, they can submit the application. If it's a basic kind of case where it raises no concerns to the neighbors, they won't object. There'd be a 20 day process, and then the zoning administrator or his designee could then review. And recognizing that these people aren't represented by a council, they're just usually homeowners, that they the zoning administrator or designee would review it with that lens and be, take the position that, okay, well, it meets these standards, hopefully they articulated it enough to justify it, and then they could grant the variance for whatever they need to do, extending the roof, extending the property back or building higher if necessary. And that would be the kind of the way to at least address more concretely the issues that your constituents are, are having. Right, so it wouldn't have to come to council, it would just be go through. In the board, my mind, that, I mean, that's really the benefit of the process, is that it would have a streamlined process that wouldn't need having, as, as a former land use lawyer, a lawyer or a consultant who does this work, it'd be a streamlined process. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Council Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just noticed throughout um, you have listed, I guess, the change not exceeding five years in different parts. Is there a reason you, uh, you picked the five years and not four or six or? Thanks. Yeah, so I, I left this part out in my initial go through. So one of the visions of this piece of legislation was to reduce the burden on the BMZA staff, which is high, like the, to um, Ms. Witt's credit, she came in as an acting director with a few spots missing, and then she was elevated to her level, and then there was no staff attorney on her team, so she's pulling like double duty and triple duty without a legal assistant on the team either. And so to process all the paperwork that goes through with all the cases, my thought was how can we help reduce that load? And so one thing that happens a lot is um, people request extensions because by kind of the standard approval right now is that after, if you get approval from the BMZA, you have one year to get a building permit to build the building. The issue is, especially in this interest rate environment, it, it can take a year after your approval to go out and get the investment and the supply chain issues. So like, it frequently can't, it will be, take more than a year all the time. And so people submit a request for an extension that the board has to process. And it's usually, in my practice, in my prior life, it was always granted, especially the first couple times you requested it, because it was like 
the developers usually diligently trying to get the funding in place to move forward, but they couldn't. And so this provision at the end of the legislation would make it by default a two-year approval, but the board, if they felt it met the, met the standards and the developer applicant asked for it, could go up to five years and say, fine, from this point forward, you have five years to do the work necessary to build this building, but no more than five, so it can't live forever, because there was a case, I think, with uh, Councilman Clark, where she rightly was aggrieved that there was like a, a project that lived for like 10 years that before it kind of built, it kind of came along, and so people were like, hey, where'd this come from? And say, oh, it was approved 10 years ago. So this at least gives us the outside date where it's like, fine, five years, you gotta come back and do another public hearing process to get it reapproved. Right, and also, uh, you know, with, with COVID, what we've seen when it comes to building permits as well, and how long things have been taking and supply chain issues that are just now starting to get back on track, um, you know, it seems like a reasonable amount of time. Does the BMZA feel that you agree with that um, amount of time as well? Okay. Um, well, I haven't discussed this, these two proposed bills with the board, so I'm just giving my own opinion. Um, okay. sure. So yeah, I think five years makes sense. We do spend a, a certain amount of time on each docket processing extension requests, and the board tends to give two or three without even really thinking about it um, too hard. Once it starts to get to four or five, then they start saying, you know, why haven't you made any progress, that kind of thing. So I think, I think five years would not be a problem for the board. Thank you for that explanation with both of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilman Torrance. I'm just going to diverge for a second. So I like the idea, but here's my question. And this is something I have. I want to express that the BMZA needs to be consistent. And I mean this as in, I'm happy you're there and they're following the law. However, I just want to make sure that board members are trained in applying the law adequately because while you are there as their advisor, I think that our me the members have been inconsistent even in their public comments. I've, I've seen that the technical writing in the agency has changed because at one time there was a decision that referred to the ninth district, but it happened in the seventh district. All those small things, I just want to make sure are tightened because that leaves us over, open for liability, and I've seen you start to move it. But I just want to add this next caveat is training board members so that they don't put us in, in a position where if we make these changes, it's not inconsistent. Thank you. Got it, thank you. Go ahead, Councilman Ramos. Um, thank you, so on the conditional use piece, I just wanna understand, I, I get the idea of people coming in saying, hey, we need more time, we need more time. Um, but I thought I also heard you uh, comment on um, the fact that we've had at least three instances in my district where someone comes up with, oh wait, there was a use permit 10 years ago, and so now we can use it again. And so what, am, is that gonna solve that, that problem in terms of, yes, it can only be five years unless you actually come back physically for an extension? Well, I think what you're describing sounds more like a kind of a grandfathering issue or maybe where it's like an issue where... 1967 is what the problem was in this particular case. Right, so if it's a little different than in this case, I think what you're describing is something which we can discuss my thought on that one sounds more like uh, the UNO was granted in 67 and then nothing happened and maybe it was vacant for a while but no one knew for sure and then you come back around to get a building permit and the community might say yeah there was nothing going on here but admittedly uh, that wasn't a single family house or a owner occupied property but still the well I mean so this legislation this condition use change this change at the end would affect in theory any approval from the BMZA so all of them so the conditional use right. piece is for everything not right just so for the the, the so what you're talking about, the kind of the grandfathering issue is something separate, which we can discuss and I have thoughts about, but the legislation here would be more for, you had to go to, you had to have a hearing either at the BMZA or have the city council approved by ordinance, a conditional use approval, or in the future, a minor variance if it would be approved by the zoning administrator. From that date, then you have two, under this draft legislation, between two and five years to get the approval as draft at the current state of the law is you have one year and then if you don't have your building permit issued either because of the delays on the city side or the applicant side or both you have to rush to get a letter in to the bmza saying hey or please please extend it for another year but that takes staff time to process that and put on the docket and have a hearing and do all the steps and so the vision for that provision is just to 
streamline it and to reduce some of that kind of administrative burden. So the other, last, the other question I had was on this minor variance piece. Um, there are communities uh, on which I represent that actually would like to have the sign posting and understand what's going on. I, that's it's not up. included in here, correct? So the, 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 yeah, I mean, I probably should have included more of the existing law. So the existing minor variance provision is in place. Admittedly, it seems, and we need to do more investigation, that we haven't deployed it as the state, the city's the zoning administrator hasn't deployed it. I think he would say it's a staff capacity issue. So the law as draft, currently drafted allows the zoning administrator or his designee, and so my vision will be to work with him to ensure he has a designee who is capable and has the capacity to start processing these quickly to make, allow people to get their approvals quickly. All right, thank uh, you. And to address the question on the sign posting, so like as drafted, the posting will be the same as it is now. So if you go to the zoning board and you have to get a, a you, right. want a, you want a, root, a fence that's taller than six feet, right. then you have to but post your giving, property. Mm -hmm. That'll still be the same case, post the property. The difference is that it'll say, if we don't, like you have 20 days to submit a written Letter. objection to uh -huh. the zoning administrator. If none's received, he'll process it as you know a normal, case just won't be a public hearing and then you know that'll be that all right thank you council uh, vice president um i see that this bill comes um was referred to the department of planning does the is it going to come before the planning commission for discussion as well i helped draft this with the, with the chair's kind of input so i'm, I'm I yeah so the council's will yeah i mean ultimately this will require i mean we didn't have there wasn't time a reasonable time to get all the bill reports, which is why this is more of an express preliminary hearing just in the beginning, get the conversation going. Um, and so, yeah, they will. Th this will be required to have bill reports from the agencies. They will be here to testify on a future in a future hearing when they've been um, when there's more time for them to prepare that. So, once there's iron out some some kinks and then have a final product to then present to the agencies. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. So question, have we cross, have we crosswalked this with the appeals court's opinion to make sure that we are consistent? I just wanna make sure that what we have before us is consistent with the appeals court's decision so that we are not directly defying the court's orders and placing her license in jeopardy. <laughs> So not officially cross-referenced it. I mean, I think the interesting part about land use law, and Adam Levine can speak to it, I didn't want to speak to it at all this afternoon, the, um, that the opinions are sort of, there aren't that many that get appealed kind of, but that's how it works in the zoning land use world. If it's like a big project that has the people behind it that support it, usually, it'll kind of, especially in the city, you'd either get approved or it wouldn't. There wouldn't be a lot of challenges to the highest level, that are, especially with reported opinions, but it happens occasionally. Um, but the land use article that sets up state law that allows the city council to make rules and regulations about land use provisions, I mean, kind of lets you have a lot of discretion how you develop that. So like this new law would then like supersede other court decisions. So like the court would then, uh, a, fu a future case would be based on what the code reads as of the time the application was reviewed. And so I it, hear you, but I just want to make sure that we are being consistent with the spirit of what the court told us, right? Because I get the opinion will be superseded by any legislation that we write. I just want to make sure that while there are several people who will probably outlive this change and they're not mandatory retirements at 70, we just don't want to piss off people. I'm just being frank that. Well, can, can, I just don't want to get into a match with the judiciary about going back and forth about whether or not we violated in some way um, the spirit of what their consistency is. Because I found the judiciary is very, I'll be frank, very mindful that they will again kick this back and say fix it again to make sure that we have in some spirit created an application where we are f fair across the board in terms of the application. So I just wanna make sure that we have crosswalked this to make sure that 
while we may supersede the existing law, that we built in structures in this new piece of legislation, um, the consistency that we can own up to, and that it doesn't have to go before the judiciary again. It's what I'm saying. Yeah, Councilman, we'll make sure that when the law department has uh, their report, uh, we will make sure that you get a copy of that and that we can have further discussion uh, before, before moving forward on the bill. And then uh, my next question is related to unique. I hate that word. I want to make sure that we really, really figure out a way to define it. It's overbroad. It has come to the point where I've had to fight with the Planning Commission about uniqueness. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that we're very specific so that it doesn't put a layman's person or a resident at a disadvantage, whereas someone else who has development lawyers and architects can tell you what the uniqueness was, whereas this person who maybe just be doing a simple ADU may not, right? I just want to make sure we have that conversation. How, how would you, uh, Councilman, if you don't mind me asking, how would you, you have a specific uh, term that you were looking for when it comes to unique? No, I just want to make sure that we have somewhere in comment how we are really going to workshop uniqueness and interpretation, if it, whether it's in memo from the board itself, what they see as unique, so that we're clear about what the, what basically, what are the balls and strikes in terms of the, con, the contest. I, I have to relate it that way to baseball. So literally, this is what uniqueness is interpreted by, by the existing board of BMZA in a memo that is signed either by their executive director or their chair, so that we know what it is, so a resident isn't like, this was unique for this developer, not unique for me. I just want to make sure we're clear about it. Yeah, and, and Councilman, just so you know, that is part of the catalyst for this bill. Um, I, yeah. I was asking the same questions about uniqueness, and the definitions that, that I had been given in the past was, you know, obviously if they all look the same, if they're all rectangle properties, square properties, so on and so forth. But then when I had properties in my district that were unique shape, um, they were still denied, and so that's that's part of the the need for uh, for this clarity and uh, and to afford residents who don't have the capacity to have lawyers uh, the opportunity to, in layman terms, be able to define what makes their property unique and why they they should be afforded this uh, a variance. Uh, any other I mean, questions? I would add too that I think this this process is designed like the the BMZA and the Miss Wet pointed out that the BMZA is tasked with interpreting the statute, interpreting the law, interpreting the facts, applying the law as you drafted. And so their job is to discern legislative intent. So if your intent is that uniqueness means one thing, then this is the kind of the, the, my vision would be that we start to you know, have a dialogue and so that if it does get litigated, lawyers can point to this kind of discussion and say, yeah, here's what Councilman Torrance, when they discussed this bill, said he thought, he thought uniqueness means this, and this is what the committee decided what Yeah, and I think food. of and I hear you, and I hear you, Justin, because I think about the examples of historic districts where uniqueness could be simply the irrigation system that created the property and how you're doing renovations to your property to have a shower and these things. That, that uniquely defines a different type of property that you'll need, which you'll have to do to your lot size to actually get the water into your property. Whereas in Reservoir Hill, it could simply be you're the only person that has a basement that has been underpinned. I just want to make sure that like we're having that conversation, but it is respective of topology, it's respective of the historic period interests of the homes. I have an Ashburton home that were built in 1920, but there's one that was just recently built in 2022 that was not unique and looked like something from Howard County, right? Which was out of, which was approved by BMZA, which was out of place with what, my community looks like. So I just think that we need to really, really process it out. And then, because I say that because while we may have legislative intent, the executive branch should also document in memos what their interpretation of our intent is as well too. That way we can have that conversation because if we go back to the table, we can go in and create a new definition in the statute to amend that intent. So I just wanna make sure that like this is, this is a both end. This is not an or, but it's both like, this is our intent. I'm gonna leave it to the professionals who do this every day to define it. I don't think I'm the best suited. I hate property law to <laughs> add in land use law, but I'm not the best suited to actually define someone's niche. Yeah, and, and thank you for that. And, and that again is, is part of the reason the, the need for this bill is same board has changed 
you know, what's considered, you know, grant worthy and unique versus not when it's the same thing in two locations. And so um, that's the purpose of the conversation. So um, do we have people who want to testify? Okay, we have two people who are signed in to testify. Anybody else who's going to want to testify is welcome to line up after them. Uh, first person I see here is uh, Joan, Joan Floyd. You got to just push the, the right button, and then you'll see the microphone light up. There you go. It's, it's red, okay. Well, I got to admit, I'm very confused because I'm only here to testify on a bill that was advertised, and I haven't heard anybody speak about that bill tonight. So I guess my question is, has it been withdrawn, or is this an amendment, is what's being talked about tonight an amendment under that same bill number? I'm very confused, and I don't, I couldn't follow, I haven't seen the, what you all are talking about. I can't testify on something I haven't seen. And so what is, please, <laughs> what is going on? Sure, so thank you uh, for that question. And um, Richard will give you a copy of what we're discussing. Well, I can't, I can't just sure. instantaneously. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna testify on the bill that was advertised. Okay, because I have a couple things I, sure. I came to say about yeah, that. Go ahead. I mean, and, and you know, whenever we introduce a bill and we have conversations on it, there's changes made. And so uh, that is we're looking to make amendments and changes based on feedback that we've received already from the advertised bill. And so we're, we'd be happy to hear um, what, you, what your feedback is. Okay, so I'm testifying on the bill that was introduced, and that's sure. the consent agenda bill. Sure. So that's, and I wanted to just share a couple. I was hoping I would hear, you know, from the BMZA, from the law department, what they were saying about it, and I'm just discouraged or disappointed not to have heard that. Um, but um, I just want to say that, you know, some of you were, were here when, when uh, participating when Transform was, was, uh, was worked through, and I, I was here in this room when uh, a big significant change was, was uh, discussed, which was um, we're gonna, we, had, we had limits on variances at one time, and the idea was we're going to get rid of the limits on variances. Now, why was that proposed and why was that approved? Planning staff um, proposed to get rid of the limits on variances because their rationale was if we got, we would stop automatically approving variances and we would actually see the BMZA do better with uh, applying the standards. That was the rationale. So that was the, that was the legislative intent, that not there would be any kind of consent agenda, but they would actually be doing better at applying the standards. So it seems like they started doing better to apply the standards and all of a sudden this this bill was introduced. So um, the bill that I'm testifying against um, seems like it it wants to create two different standards for variances. One in which the board must apply a whole set of standards and then another one in which the board may not, or must not, is not able to, has no ability to, is, is prevented from. And that is, that's just not, that's not what, um, what you want to do in, in, in a city. It's not what you want to do with your, to your citizens. And it's certainly not consistent. I really appreciate the comments of, of the councilman because consistency really is, it's fair. You know, you can be consistent, you can be fair. Um, I do think that the bill that, is, that was advertised as a due process violation uh, has due process violation um, embedded in it um, because the, the code doesn't, on variances I'm talking about, the code doesn't require you to actually be present or protest anything because the code is there representing you and the code, the standards are there so you don't have to be there to press the standards because they already exist. They're already in place. The only other thing I wanted to say was I would like to actually know what appellate decision was, was being discussed. I'm very interested in that. It was a reference to appellate decision, but it wasn't, it wasn't identified, it wasn't cited. But I do, I do like to refer back to the state law. Um, and I just, it's good to return to that from time to time, the land use article. So I gotta take my glasses off to read. Um, so it says the zoning regulations that you all adopt uh, shall be, among other things, in accordance with the plan and uh, designed to 
properly manage growth and development, and also include reasonable consideration for encouragement for orderly development. And so orderly development and consistency is a very good thing, um, but to create two completely different scenarios and so that one person gets what they want just because nobody showed up and the other person can't get what they want because the standards are, are applied. It's just, that's the opposite of order, that's chaos. So that's all I wanna say. I'm just testifying on what I know was available as a bill today on the internet. <laughs> that's it. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Uh, next up, Al Barry. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Al Barry, um, I've been uh, before this uh, committee and uh, Councilman Middleton's committee on uh, any number of occasions going back to the old zoning code. I've been sort of involved in zoning for over 50 years, if you can believe it. I can't believe it sometimes. Through a variety of the city councils, a variety of zoning boards, a variety of directors. And I will say that the uh, issue that I happen to observe in real time uh, when the board itself was wrestling with this issue of equity and uh, consistency uh, was something that I think they, they have a sincere interest in trying to resolve. It's just that there's a to paraphrase uh, somebody that says, you know, if you ask three lawyers or three judges for an opinion, you might get four different ones. I mean, it's really in the eye of the beholder. And this uniqueness standard is sort of odd in and of itself from the standpoint that Baltimore City under the State Zoning and Alien Act is recognized as a unique piece of the, of the state. And there are standards that we have to abide by, the board has to abide by, but in and of itself, Baltimore is unique and our zoning code is not as, you know, it's a it should be a dynamic, um, a dynamic document that uh, Councilman Middleton and the Planning Department have tried, I think each year, or try every other year to make amendments to it as they become aware of inconsistencies that Councilman Ramos uh, brought up. So the history of the consent agenda, which is, I guess, a subject of the bill, goes back, uh, David Kinkoff, who was named uh, the zoning board chair, and he was an attorney, very good attorney, I would comment on, said, you know, we're spending six hours a day every two weeks on this, and we have half, if not more, of these issues are not contested. They're not, they're not major issues. Can't we streamline it some way? And that's, that was the advent of the consent agenda, and that, you know, uh, that was handled, uh, I'd say, relatively consistently. We handled probably 50 to what, 75. What year was that? Do you, do you recall? Do you recall approximately what year that was? Well, Kink, it was uh, O'Malley was the mayor. He was he appointed him as the chair. I think, who, so. who was the mayor? Uh, O'Malley. O'Malley. Okay. Okay. Mayor O'Malley. So it's been a, it's been a while, um, and I handle fifty to seventy five zoning appeals um, a year, easily. And the vast majority of those are variances, or they're conditional uses with variances. And we, one of the advantages that Baltimore City has, as opposed to some jurisdictions where you have to have a lawyer or you have to spend a lot of money to get something, is really a disincentive to homeowners or property owners that want to improve their property. After all, they want to invest in Baltimore City. They want to improve the building, it might be vacant. They want to add a, a more retail space for, uh, for a neighborhood shopping area. I mean, Inherently, they're not, these things that come before the board is not something that the city should make it difficult to happen, in my opinion. And, you know, under the, uh, we've been testifying under the Baltimore Development Work Group for many years on changes to transform, and we expect that we'll be involved in looking at this new bill, which I think is a step in the right direction. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I would say that the, interest of the city should not, somebody said consistency uh, would be wreck havoc in a say to paraphrase Ms. Floyd, you know, cities are not consistent. 
cities, the, the, the virtue of cities is that they have vitality, they have, they have uniqueness in and of themselves, and let's not stifle people that want to invest in the city by a process which is too expensive, takes too long. I already have had, I think, a half a dozen people that have called me, these are individual property owners or they're working with a realtor, that are put everything on hold pending the resolution of this issue. I don't think we, it should wait necessarily for the council to fix it, although clarification would be, would be helpful. I, I think there's, uh, uh, I go back many boards and some boards would look at how you define uniqueness differently because uniqueness came about from a St. Mary's County court decision. Well, that has nothing to do with Baltimore City. And, and it's been amended from time to time by various court of appeals or court of special appeals. That's what the, the lawyers on the board are worried about. And I would hope that uh, the law department and Ms. Witt and, uh, uh, could work with the deputy mayor, who has, frankly, a lot of experience in this, to advise the board that they have more flexibility than I think they've been taking, particularly in some of these cases for homeowners that just want to put a, a side addition on to enlarge their family. So that's my comments, if there are any questions. All right, thank you very much, um, Mr. Barrett. And I think you kind of like echo my thoughts on, on the bill also, which is that this bill is really great for the city. Uh, and it's pretty much great for everybody except for lawyers because they don't get as many jobs. <laughs> If the we might not get as much, that's fine. Right, so that's I mean, fine. I'd, I'd rather right, and, and that's, get better. And that's an industry that you know, I don't mind disrupting. I think that it's important that we allow the residents to invest in their property. Uh, they're using their own money to invest in their property, which helps the Baltimore City tax base. And we have uh, we have a big issue in the city. I believe one of the most fundamental uh, foundation issues we have is our population. Uh, the city at one point was close to a million people, and we're now down below 600,000, uh, which has a lot of, you know, which there's a lot of consequences with that. We have, um, we have a lot of neighborhoods that are um, food deserts. That wouldn't happen if neighborhoods were full of people. If blocks um, had, two, had, had 20 people living on the block instead of two people on the block, uh, that wouldn't happen. You would have businesses. Businesses go to where people are. If, if our communities are full, the houses are full, we don't have the vacants, um, that, that really helps everything. Um, and when it comes to our tax base, uh, whenever anybody invests in their property, you see it firsthand every single day that when their property values go up, their cost of property taxes go up, uh, which is more money for the city's revenue. And it doesn't really cost us more money. You know, when we have, you know, we have blocks right now in the city that have two people living on it. The trash trucks still need to go down it. Um, the recycling trucks still need to go down it every other week. Uh, but they still have to turn on the street lights. You still have all the same functions, but there's only two people living on the block. And so it doesn't cost us that much more to have the block full. Uh, and when we get residents to move back into the communities, to invest in the city, the schools would be full. If the schools are full, then we get the right funding for our school systems instead of having to consolidate and close down schools. And by having, increasing our population, I really feel that uh, we're gonna get more businesses, we get more businesses, we create more jobs, you create more jobs, you reduce, uh, you reduce crime, you reduce crime, but just everything across the city benefits by having more people in our city. And uh, this is definitely something that, as you just mentioned, I'm also hearing that people are looking to move into, the, some people are looking to move into the city uh, a lot in my district as well. Uh, but they are on hold, not knowing whether or not they're going to be able to add a deck, add, you know, a patio, add uh, a room for their, you know, for their in-laws or for their parents. And so uh, this is really important work that we get this, that we get this resolved, although I wanted to make sure we had proper discussion on it. So that's why this is an abbreviated, uh, streamlined um, conversation, but we will come back at a later date for a broader conversation with agency reports. Um, and so... I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I would just, I want to add to what the uh, question on, on the extension that's in the draft. Um, I think it is from somebody who gets involved from the planning of a project to the building permits of a project. Uh, this is true for small projects and certainly larger projects. It is impossible to get a permit 
within a year of the time the board gets approval, except for the most minor aspects. There will be people that will not go to that step until they know they have the zoning approval. And then they hire the architect to do final plans. That may take two or three months or four months or five months for a large project. And then it may take the city a year to review it. And, and then you got to go back to the board, which the uncertainty doesn't help the financing of a project. So I think five years is a, is a great start for that. And uh, the board does grant extensions. They're, they've been very uh, thoughtful about reviewing those on a case-by-case -case basis. But that takes their time as well. So I support the notion of the extension being, and which was a point we made when Transform was first adopted. To, frankly, we, we said it's too short. But it, it is what it is, and change it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, is there anybody who has not yet testified that wishes to testify? Okay, no. so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we are now in recess, and we'll resume at a later date.